Welcome on Inside, yet another edition of the Business of Social podcast powered by STN Digital. I'm your host, David Brickley. Each and every show, we talk to the experts to get their ever-changing advice on the ever-changing digital social marketing landscape. This show is no different. Episode number 86, as we inch so much closer to episode 100. I still got to figure out what we're doing for uh, you know the century mark. Um, but hey, real quick, just wanted to update the listeners uh, on some news. So as you all know, um, producer Will has been such an amazing part of this program. He has moved on to a new venture. So we just wanted to wish him well uh, on his next chapter and just thank him so much. I mean, I think honestly, over the last shoot, probably like 65 episodes or so, um, you know, Will has been in the in the passenger seat with me, helping me book all the guests and helping uh, produce the show. You guys have also, I always say this podcast is such an intimate experience that right now I could be in your head, right? Like uh, headphones, maybe I'm coming out of your car speaker. Uh, so you kind of feel like you know people when you listen to the podcast. So a lot of our longtime listeners, I know you were a fan of producer Will, of course, as I was as well. Um, and just wish him all the best and thank him for all his amazing work on the podcast. What One thing I was thinking of as I was reminiscing is just those dark days of COVID, like those first few weeks, you know, Will and I uh, put together a few shows for the listeners and we were both trying to figure out like what the hell is going on and how can we help the consumer and help the listener. And it was almost therapeutic in a way. So I always remember that as like a, a good time um, that we had together. So thanks again, Will, for all your help and appreciate um, everything that you did for the show. Um, that being said, I can't do this alone. I, I need some help here. So uh, brought on an amazing uh, employee over at STN, and she's helping out on the podcast, uh, KG, Katie Gillen. So say hello to the fine folks. Hello, everyone. Yes, I am known as KG. Also, the little ticket, I'm not quite as tall as Kevin Garnett, who is the big ticket. Mm. So um, yes, excited to be here and helping out with the show. Awesome. So thank you so much for your help and jumping in um, here for episode 86. All right. So what we usually do is we look at maybe the age of an uh, actor, but we kind of went back to sports numbers. It is 86. So talk me through, what, what, what do we have at 86 uh, here for a potential name of the show? Top of mind has to be Heinz Ward. I think as like the quintessential- Are you a Steeler fan or something? I am not actually, but as like the <laughs> top dude, 86, um, we also have Buck Buchanan, James Lofton, or Todd Heap. Mm, some Hall of Famers in there. I will agree. This is going to be the Heinz Ward podcast, uh, episode number 86. All right. So we are so excited to talk to uh, Kiar Kimsky. She's a VP of Global Consumer Marketing at The Knot. Uh, you guys know The Knot well. If you've been to any wedding in the last decade, uh, maybe even longer, you have probably gone to The Knot to RSVP. Or if you've had a wedding, you've probably used them to uh, do everything. And I'm excited to talk about that. They also have the bump, which um, I wasn't aware of initially before the program, but uh, that helps you with all things uh, baby related. So they, the customer journey here, at KG, can lead you all the way from the engagement all the way through later in life. So, I mean, they've, they've got that figured out, but they've been in business for about 25 years. They are global, I think 16 countries. They've helped over 25 million couples plan a wedding. And just everybody knows the knot. I mean, it's just like, it's it's part of what we do now is, is, as Google is or Facebook or what have you. So I'm so excited to talk to Kiara on the program, the VP of Global Marketing at The Knot. All right. She is the VP of Global Consumer Marketing at The Knot. Kiara Kimsky joins us on the program. Kiara, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you, David. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Huge fan. Awesome. I appreciate it. So I've been using this uh, question at the top of shows just to kind of get people warm. Um, if you were the host of a late night TV show, who would you book as your first guest and why? Ah, oh, man. Um, who would I book? Um, I don't, that's a good one. I don't know. I, um, I, I'm a huge fan of Mindy Kaling. Like I, um, huge, huge girl crush, uh, love, uh, a lot of the work. I just finished, um, uh, sex lives with college girls. And so, um, yeah, I'd, I'd want to, I want to guess. I agree. That's a good. <laughs> I always say Jamie Foxx because you have the talent of like comedy and music and yeah. acting. So you need some way to like drive the drive the ratings, you know? So Yes, um, for sure. Give you a lot of good meat. Exactly. So listen, I'm so excited to talk to you because I think everybody um, has at least been on the Knots website for some way, shape, or form. And it's gonna be really interesting to dig in with you on the brand that you got you guys have created much more than just a a park website that you can use um, for invitations. And, and you guys have really built this amazing brand. But to start, would you just let the audience know what you all do as VP of uh, Global Consumer Marketing on a day-to-day? -day? 
Yes, I'm happy to. So the Not Worldwide is actually um, a global family and life stage experience brand. And we cover across 16 different countries, wow. which many people don't don't fully know about us. Um, and we help couples plan and celebrate life's biggest moments. And that's everything from, of course, the knot, which are most uh, well known for in the US on the wedding side, but we also have the bump and, and pregnancy and, and a few others that really um, help couples plan and celebrate life's biggest moments. Um, so on the wedding, our most known brand on the wedding side for the knot, um, we really offer this kind of all in one wedding planning resource from inspiration to finding your vendors, um, to creating a, a really meaningful experience for your guests and wedding registries, invitations, and the whole gamut. We we really try to make it as easy as possible. I love it. So, so many different ways to go with you on this. Um, I'm going to start with the first thing that came to mind for me was the wedding boom that is happening right now. So, you know, after COVID, I mean, so many weddings, as we all know, with our friends, family, et cetera, got postponed. Uh, I've been talking to just some friends that even work like in uh, suits and design and things like that too. Like they're still experiencing their busiest time ever. So what have you all seen? I mean, it just, it completely paused there for a while, which is probably a little scary for the core of your business. And then, I mean, now it's just, it's probably never been busier. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So we are, we are definitely in the boom. Um, the latest um, we've been talking about is, is about 2.6 million weddings are happening this year, which is about 20% more wow. um, than, than normal on any given year. Um, and so it's pretty, pretty amazing. A lot of pent up demand, but it, it is both those that delay during COVID, but it's also, you know, kind of sequel weddings, this, this duplication, because you did sort of the mini. Yeah. The wedding. backyard wedding. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And so people still really wanting that time and that big celebration with family and friends. So um, that's what's really driving a, a lot of that pent up demand. But it is it's pretty, you know, the I was having a conversation most recently with um, one of our, our vendors. Um, in our marketplace. And they were saying that, you know, our inventory is days, right? And so there's only so many days and you don't multiply that. So there's been a lot of shifting in, in the space um, to make time and make, you know, weddings happen. And so mid midweek weddings are a thing this year as well. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of movement for this boom. I'd love to hear from you, uh, just the, the opportunity, right? I mean, before the knot comes into play and there's like a market op, right? Or there's an opportunity to really become the go-to spot when you want to uh, announce your wedding or have people RSVP, things like that. Can you talk me through the origination of the company and kind of where the market was at the time and what niche that you guys provided or kind of filled for the consumer? Yes, no, um, I definitely can. So the Not actually just celebrated our 25th anniversary wow. uh, last year. So you're going way back to um, the AOL days where we were, um, we sort of owned a tab <laughs> uh, and were, you know, we were the the space for advice on weddings and that was it. I mean, it really just started, you know, early Got stage it. adopter um, and it really was all about providing kind of condensed information and advice for what is a really stressful kind of overwhelming experience for many. Um, and so at that time we were really a first mover and we leaned into supporting couples. That's awesome. So then at what point does it become more of the, I guess the digital company has become um, starting, I guess, starting with what we probably know you most for is like that RCP. I mean, I think every couple just immediately starts a not yeah. page, you know, when they, when they start planning their wedding, right? Yeah. It's been, it's been, you know, progress over that run. I mean, you know, the date, the specific dates are, are going to escape me, but in the early 2000s, right, launching our first app, um, right, around RSVPs and, mm -hmm. and, and sort of helping on, on that side and guest experience uh, on that front. Two years ago, um, we really just launched our paper, you know, the Not Invitations paper offering, um, and, and which is currently our fastest growing product. And so we've been continually innovating. So every couple of years, adding on new things that we see um, our couples need and that are really pain points. Um, right. Making sure that in our vendor marketplace, there's innovation that, you know, we've been adding in to, to make it different and unique um, and really support all the needs that are very specific to the wedding industry. Um, so that that kind of innovation has been core to each each journey that we've been on. But and it doesn't stop there. We're, we're also looking at new things in our in our roadmap and especially from a global offering perspective. Um, what, where do we need to be and what do we need to do? And then, you know, I want to get into like some core, just your overall philosophies on marketing, but I, I love where we're going here. Um, 
how do you guys look at once a consumer comes into your environment, right? So I'm a consumer. I'm signing up for my friend's wedding, letting them know that I'm going to be there. Once you're able to introduce your brand to that person, how have you guys kind of, I guess, developed the spider web of value and different props that you can offer that consumer to extend the brand much more than, like I said earlier, just a landing page? Yes. So there's, there's, um, I guess you can think about value or, or the way that we mm-hmm. might think about value is, is across a number of different consumers, right? That experience us and experience our offering, right? There's the role we pay with couples, right? Where they come to us of like, what the heck do I register for all the way to how do I manage this difficult, you know, planning conversation yeah. with, you know, my, um, my soon to be in-laws, uh, right. <laughs> and so, and it's, and it runs the gamut, right. From sort of inspiration all the way through to the logistical elements of actually planning. The other relationship that we have is with guests and that are, that yes. are looking for a similar advice or to your point, like mm-hmm. after they come to that wedding registry, right. What do they, what do they pick? How do they find that information? Right. What's an easy way for them um, to find, you know, the, the bookings where they want to stay when they're going to that, that, that destination wedding or advice around how to handle, um, you know, things around that destination wedding. So we do have a relationship and, and a value exchange as well with that consumer. And then I would say, because a, a big, you know, a massive part of our business is really around this kind of double-sided marketplace where, wedding professionals, we are a platform for them right. to, to connect with couples. Um, and so whether that's, you know, um, DJs or makeup artists, wedding planners, I mean, the value we provide to them is really connecting them with couples and making sure that we're helping to share with them what couples want and need and, and kind of, you know, be more, um, uh, grow their business in a big way. And so that value exchange is also really yeah. important on that side as well. So really a one-stop shop. I was just going to ask you that question in terms of like revenue streams and different ways that you can provide value. I mean, I'm assuming that you have these partnerships where in certain states or cities, maybe you can have an exclusive with an hotel that you have a deal with that you can push to everybody that's on the RSVP list. I mean, I guess what have you guys found to be the most successful in terms of utilizing your brand, your customer database in order to grow the brand overall in those situations. Because I think ultimately it may, it's a win-win-win, right? Because the the hotel or the partner gets more customers, you guys are able to get a cut, and then also it's value for the consumer to have an easy one-stop shop. Yeah, no, it definitely is. And it's really thinking about how do we kind of service all sides mm-hmm. and really being at the, the center of that. So it's really, you know, future-proof our business, but also really streamline on decision-making, right? Yeah. Like there is so much that is being thrown at you at this phase. And so um, that that's a key part of, of what we hope to provide and to do uh, overall is really streamline that. But at the center of it too, right? We know that couples prefer choice. So it's not just about providing sort of one thing, right? And our registry is a great example of this, where we know um, couples want multiple registries. We know that they want, right, a large selection, whether it's, you know, cash funds, experiences, every, you know, new items for your home or upgrade your home, right? Providing that breadth is really um, where we see the the need state and what couples want. And so in many ways, we kind of have to enable that, right. um, which provides opportunity, right, to continue uh, on our on our growth path as well. So I want to back up a little bit, just kind of overall with your background. I know you worked at Ancestry as well, which I think is super interesting. But let's back up just to get some thoughts on the macro lens of marketing. How do you approach marketing? Like what's your core belief on on how to go into any campaign or any brand? Yes, uh, that's a that's a great question. So one one thing that I try to to guide every decision that we do is is one, um, how can we simplify every decision that we make? Right, the the best ideas are the ones that are going to ring true the cleanest, um, and that we're not kind of overburdening a, a ton of things with that. So simplify and really be core connected to to what the consumer value is or what their their kind of perceived value is and what we're trying to do and so starting everything from that that point um is 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 how my kind of general philosophy when it comes to to marketing especially in this highly saturated space where messaging you know and messages are being thrown at you um we really need to be as as clear and concise and as simple as possible so that's definitely how i approach it and i think the other thing that really drives me and where i've kind of made my decisions around the brands that I work with in my career is that I I do believe that, you know, um, 
both brands, but the way that you connect to consumers is, is definitely an emotional sense. And I want to be as connected to the brands that I think have the emotional range yeah. to really connect with consumers and that can give joy to to marketers, right? And in the work that we do and how we want to tell it. And and so for me, it's, it's really about making it meaningful in our storytelling, but and, and trying our best to make it as measurable as possible. That brings it to the next question I had. So I'll go back to the not, not overall marketing. <laughs> so what is, um, with that being said, Gen Z is the next up, right? They're going to be the next generation and, and already are of folks getting married and will soon be, I'm sure, your biggest demographic of folks getting married on a regular basis. What have you seen so far the differences between millennials and Gen Z? And have you definitely adjusted your marketing in order to, because you know we, we've heard through research, right, that Gen Z definitely wants a purpose. They want to Yep. Wrap their wrap their arms around the brand. They don't want it just a big corporation. So, what have you guys seen, yeah. or maybe adjusted on your side? Oh yes, uh, spot on. I spent a lot of time thinking about Gen Z and 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 where do we need to be and how do we think about it. So officially, though, this year is sort of when they enter peak marrying age. So I, I very much view them as my my customer coming in, my my key my key target. Um, and so the ways that we are adapting is you're spot on, right? Part of it is they want to be connected. They want to feel value, you know, and they're part of the decision-making of the, the brand yeah. they work with or who they, they want to put their money behind the things that matter to them. And so for us, that's really been um, a, a key part of leaning into our DE&I strategy. That has been core to the knot from the very beginning. I mean, in the early 2000s, you know, we really threw our support behind, you know, marriage equality in a really big way. And that's really guided a lot of yeah. where we show support and the things we do. But I think it's also taking it to like, the next stage of that, which isn't about, you know, um, representation, which we see a lot of, of, of brands leaning into right now, but it's really around how do you kind of make, make an impact and move the needle forward. A really, you know, just a great example of that is, is we have conversations around how can we better, in, um, you know, start conversations around inner able couples, right? And so what are, what are venue needs for, for those couples yeah. that are, going to be, you know, navigating that and how do you make that experience the best to support those needs as well? Um, and can you, can we spark a conversation with pros equally as we support couples and, and vice versa. Or it's it's things like the bump recently just launched um, a black maternal health hub where we you know had a, a social live discussion with um, a doctor to talk about you know advice for black parents. And so these are ways that we're trying to like kind of really drive at some Love utility that. here and, mm -hmm. and to push forward and and that's ways that we know connect with with Gen Z. And I also think it's it's you know adapting to the way in which they're consuming information like platforms are different yes right like i'm sure you you guys are talking about tiktok all the time yeah. but that it is the, the vehicle that they're receiving information and making sure that like we're adapting we, we got to go there and we got to um you know make uh make content in a way that can be consumed in the way in which they want to receive it and so it's both what we're saying but where we're saying it as well yeah, I've. Uh, I mean, listen, I've said this so much. I'm sure my audience is sick of me, but <laughs> I, I, I think marketers really get it wrong when they have one hero 30 second promo that's meant for television and plastered across all their social channels. Because, like you said, your audience on TikTok is expecting you to use that platform in a genuine, authentic way, yeah. and that's not what that platform is for. That platform is very much UGC, talent yeah. face in front of the camera, trends, sounds, things like that. Uh, so I couldn't agree more, and it sounds like you guys have figured that out really well. Um, going back to the macro a little bit, I think it's so important for sales and marketing at any organization to be in lockstep in order to make sure marketing is funneling sales, and also you understand um, you know, what is driving the business from a revenue standpoint so your marketing yeah. campaigns can ladder up to that. How do you explain the difference? I always like to ask this question between sales and marketing because I think a lot, of, a lot of professionals mix up the two quite a bit. Yes, no, it's true. And, and it'll vary between, you, you know, the, the role that a sales or a marketing org might play given yeah. on your business or structure. But I like to think that like marketing's job is to make it easier for a sales team. Mm. Like we want to make those phones ring, right? Yeah. To make those inbound inquiries happen. And so how are we um, thinking about making a sales org's job easier? Um, and what are the, and, and making that really a two-way conversation, right? Which is like, what are you hearing on the ground? What do we need to be talking about? How can we enable you, right? How can 
we keep you informed around your, your customer and sharing those insights and that dialogue? Yeah. But um, I think when, you know, marketing and sales come together and marketing can really be that kind of broad shift that or shift that kind of lifts all, all tides, that's, that's when, um, that's when we really, we really shine and we can do a, a good job for our company. What's a common mistake you see other brands, you don't have to name names, um, but a common mistake you see other brands or marketers make um, with their campaigns or with their brand? Hmm. Um, well, an easy one is, is to your point, which you set up great, which is where you kind of take one message and just resize it for all the channels, right? right. right? You don't actually think platform native or, or you don't think about how you can take a concept and translate that to each to each channel or each audience, sometimes a, a message that's designed for a consumer, um, right? A, in our case, a couple might not be the same right message that's designed for a wedding professional. And so, 100%. how do we, how do you tailor your messaging? Um, and equally, how do you design it to deliver in the best way? Gosh, I see that all the time. Where I'm like, that was just a resizing exercise. Really, um, it wasn't. It wasn't kind of landed. I think another thing too is we really underestimate how um, you know, as, as a marketer, I look at this where a, a kernel of an idea can come from a, a unique place, right? Whether that's a social conversation or, or some you know bit of criticism that might have come up in, the, in a press conversation, right? Can actually be a catalyst for right. uh, a really strong kind of marketing idea. And so sometimes we think they need to start you know, the best ideas need to start in a big creative, you know, agency ideation session, but sometimes they're, they're sitting in really um, unique places within a social ecosystem or within a, a consumer conversation. One of my favorite campaigns this year was uh, Ted Lasso on Twitter. You might've saw this, but <laughs> toast me instead of roast me. And he just like gave a bunch of compliments to big brands and yeah. a very easy concept, very cheap, exactly. fun concept, but it made waves, won awards, the whole thing. Cause it's like, it was true to the brand. It was yeah. genuine. And it was just like, you know, we, we like to say go viral, but it really did. Like it really like, you know, we all kind of saw it in our industry. Absolutely. Like what Duolingo is doing right now, uh, which is just like, that's just a great example of like, trust your team, like let them experiment, yeah. right? have some, you know, freedom to be bold, but um, I, I get a kick out of, of watching their work and seeing and how irreverent um, some of the, their work is, but exactly. Yeah. Put your consulting hat on for me. I asked guests to do this quite a bit. You're being asked to come into a brand new brand. They haven't started any marketing. You got a whiteboard in a conference room. Where do you start? Mm, gosh, where do I start? Um, I start with uh, the consumer and what are we solving? Yeah. What is the pain point and what is our um, our mission to solve? Um, and and trying through all the <laughs> all the competing priorities to go back to that. But um, what are we here to solve? Yeah, I think, you know, I liked what you said earlier. How do we simplify the messaging? Because I think so many marketers are so close to the brand, yeah. uh, myself included with my with my own company and brand, that you you assume everybody knows the the lingo. They know your product offering. They know that you also offer this and that. And understanding that, like, you only have a small amount of time with the consumer and you got to be able to get it away uh, very quickly and make them understand very quickly what your value prop is is so important. Um, and I think sometimes you just get too close to the brand and you feel, oh yeah, they already know that. Like, no, they don't know that. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's true. But, you know, think about, I think about us too, where we're, you know, a, a heritage brand, we've been around for 25 years, right? And what was our offering then is not our offering now. Right. And so that evolution, right? And that maturity as product lines roll out and 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 you kind of build from there, that that needs, that can shift as well. But how do you not make it an ant? And, and you might need to make it mm -hmm. an or, right? Around what is your, your lead message yeah. at any point? time because very easily you can see brands that like we were known for this thing and then we're going to add on this thing and now it's about this thing um which is 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 a struggle as well walk me through influencers um and how they have helped you build your brand over time because i'm sure that helps with gen z and then leveraging them as well for the tiktoks of the world things like that to be kind of those brand ambassadors so what have you seen be successful with you guys so far Yes. Um, influencers are such a core part, hmm. goodness, of our, our marketing uh, mix overall. And we utilize them in, a, in many different ways. So part of um, kind of our, our, you know, foundational work is, is potentially some of the more known 
talent and we utilize them for our magazine and we utilize them in a lot of ways um, for cover stars and, and for press opportunities and things like that. We also, um, every year, kind of what we call most influential wedding crew, where we take a, a select group of, of varying um, levels of um, influencer as far as their, their reach and size and, and really work with them to plan their wedding and we're their expert, mm. right? So when they're, you know, navigating questions, we're there to answer those questions for them and, and hope they kind of share that, that experience throughout. Um, and we utilize them and we, we kind of take them. We, we just had a group that we took to Guatemala that was really wonderful um, to really kind of give them a little bit of wedding planning boot camp and, and spend some, some intimate time with them. But that, um, that is, that is a core part of what we do. And, and right now we're also working on um, creating some collections with, with different influencers where, Hey, what would you register for? Go make a collection, right. And, and share that um, with your, your um, followers and fans so they can get a little bit of an inter, uh, you know, intimate look into to what you're, you're building and what you're thinking about as well. Yep. Do you have any fun stories you can think of or campaigns where you like a B tested your audience in a way that surprised you or kind of changed your perception on a campaign or a product you guys were launching? That's a great question. <laughs> um, let me think. Some different. Well, I think um, nothing super comes top to mind most recently, but I will tell you part of what um, I'm trying to learn into right now is a little bit of what are those preference differences with different audience segments right now. So less around like kind of champion challenger strategy, but can, you know, your test design actually start to create audience segmentation and clusters for you. So a great example of that yeah. might be right where you lean into segmentation as a starting point. Um, and then you're like this message, I think it is what this audience wants, but is there a way where you actually think about audience segmentation from the lens of let's actually use stimuli to inform who are the audiences that are actually gravitating to one thing or another. And so it's, it's potentially a slight shift, but that um, because we have to learn into what are the things that Gen Z want. I, right. you know, I'm pretty bullish on, on learning through them and, and let them tell us. And part of that is we're going to be our marketing strategy, right? If yeah. you're liking this, you know, content, or if you're engaging with this, there, there's a cohort of you that, that might have a commonality here. And, and how do we um, leverage that? Yeah. Up? It's amazing if you just listen, right? If you listen to the yeah. comments and consumers, they start to tell you what they're expecting or what they would love for you to, to do. And you can let that know to your engineering team or, you know, your, your, your team to kind of create that product. And it's just like, it's amazing. So um, how do you approach social? So what, what's your core belief on how to leverage social for a brand like The Knot, maybe even in past stops in your career? Um, you know, what's your, how, how do you, how do you build a community? What's your yeah. approach to it? Yeah. Well, it, it's, you know, throughout my, my career and broader, like I, I view social, right, is the core is about building community. And, and we always talk about that. But what's really unique, uh, I have found in my time with The Knot is, is also that like, it is a utility for couples that they are looking at it for inspiration and advice. Yeah. Right. And so, yes, it's about, you know, building that community and discussion. And, and you guys are kind of in the same, you know, planning journey within each other. But you know, think about the role of social also being that place for inspiration, right? Like your, your wedding planning journey really starts on social. Um, and so keeping that core and being that reliable resource uh, for that is, is something that started our social strategy. And it is, it is a priority that we make sure that we maintain all the way through for sure. And I think the other part is I was alluding to a, a little earlier on that kind of double-sided marketplace, like we, we focus a lot on um, kind of couples for sure and that inspiration, but it's also creating a dialogue between professionals within the space and sort of the vendors that are that are servicing couples and then also um, creating that dialogue within couples as well. And how can we continue to foster that ecosystem um, is, a, is a key part of what we try to think about. How do we do that and how do we do that better? Uh, I love what you guys have done with the bump as well, because, uh, you know, one of my questions I wanted to ask you is, I'm sure you guys have been met with the task of how do we make our consumers stick, right? How do we make sure we're not a utility and what's that customer journey look like after the wedding? Um, unfortunately, divorce rate is high, so I'm, I'm sure you have some repeat customers. However, I'm just thinking in terms of once yeah. you are introduced to our brand, how do we keep you around for longer? It sounds like the bump is like, great, you had a wedding, you're about to have a kid, we have another yeah. uh, piece of value for you or we can help you out with that as well. But what strategies or what, you know, what have you guys kind of done to say like, okay, we can offer you this utility uh, and, and that's why you probably know of us from maybe a friend or a family member, but here's how we're going to make our consumers stick and stay with us for 10 years. 
Yes, no, it, it's a great point, right? I think about the bump is sort of that, that's our, our repeat customer, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> we hope you only have one wedding, but yes. Right, I have, have nine kids, more, we'd love to help you out, yeah. The, but for the bump, yes, hopefully yeah. you, you, we will have a, a long-term relationship for, for you of all kinds. But yeah, it's about, you know, making sure that we're carrying them through that that journey and being there for them along the way. But in, in many ways also, right, like there there's unique questions and there's unique decisions that'll, that'll come come out in um in your your journey to parenthood and and that is not the same for everyone and it is by no means linear and for many people and so that um again we anchor from a place of like really supporting those um parents and starting from yeah. advice and guidance and if you can do that right i think you, we can build trust to offer everything else you're going to trust our advice when you register yeah, the yeah. Item. but like that we have to service and do that well because they're, they're, you know, that's, I can imagine the, the, the sort of stress, if you're a new parent, um, you will, you want to spend with abandon, you will do anything to make sure you do not mess that up. Um, and so we need to be there for support as a starting point. You talk about building community. I've been asking a lot of the guests this same question. It's a, it's, there's no right or wrong answer. It's a tough question to, to answer, but with so many things happening over the last couple of years, obviously with COVID, capital insurrection, Black Lives Matter marches, even recently with the Roe v. Wade decision potentially coming down, when you're when you're trying to be true to that community and make sure you're speaking out for marriage equality and things like that, how do you how do you approach these very sensitive hotbed topics as a brand? How do you choose when you should make a statement, when you should speak up, and when you should maybe take a back seat? And I, there's no right answer here, but I'd love to see how you've navigated, yeah. especially the last two years. Oh my goodness. I, I feel like you were in my meetings today <laughs> at work because um, that is that is a core one, right? So even the the topic um, today uh, that that's really kind of you know hitting the, the news wires, right? Like how do we define what is our, our true purpose and where do we want to to take a stand and, and when don't we? I mean, I yeah. find the hardest part for us is like we, we innately care about a lot of things, but we can't take a, a meaningful stand against everything. And right. so more important when I'm, you know, working with my teams, it's around like, what are the things we're going to say no to? Like, it's going to hurt. We're not going to love that, but we right. got to make sure that we're going to say no to something. Right. So it's making sure early on, like, what are the things we're, we might not put our all weight around, but what are the core things that we know, you know, are true to, to us and to our customers and that matter a lot, like marriage equality done. Like that is, that is core to us. And it's always been core to our brand. Um, and, you know, reproductive safety, right? Like we yeah. we're in the bump and we guide and we support in that way. And so those elements that are just core to what we offer and, and where we, we feel like we have a place, it's, it's really being careful, but making sure that you have a place to, to actually talk about that instead of just casting your weight against everything. Yeah, that's a great that's a great um, piece of advice for anybody listening. Like if you're not true to your core values, you're not really sure exactly what your core is, it's difficult to know when you step up or not because everything ladders back up to that, right? If you're about diver- diversity, inclusion, equity, well then if something is um, an attack on diversity, well then you know it's time to speak up, right? Like I think those are the things that a lot of brands maybe haven't figured out or they're finally having those conversations because of all the things in the press and things that have happened the last couple of years. No, absolutely. But I also think too, like some of these topics are just super broad, right? Like inclusivity is just a broad concept. Yes, yes. And you can be for that, but how how do you lean into inclusivity? Like what does that really look like for you and your brand? And yeah. how do you make that narrow? Like going back to that like focus and simplicity, because sometimes these con- these concepts are just too broad that, that, that you can say yes to everything and you'll find a way to make it fit. That's a good, that's a great point too. Uh, I would love to go back to TikTok for a second because I know there's so many wedding trends <laughs> coming straight out of TikTok. Uh, so how do you, I guess, as those trends get curated, how do you pass it back on to the consumer? Like, do you see things taking, get fire on social and that automatically becomes part of your guys' strategy to offer? Like, how's that all work? Especially with baby announcements. I know that's all over social media right now. So yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. There's, I mean, so UGC, if you follow any, right. Of them, right. You know, like we are big on UGC. Yeah. Like we find a gem and we, you know, ask for permission and we want to, we want to create some amplification mm-hmm. against that because there's, there's so many trends and, and popular things happening. I mean, one of my most favorite ones that I recently just saw is that like, this um this groom was asking his groomsmen by icing them to be his groom um and, and that you know went viral air quotes yeah. um for for us and for others but seeing some of these trends too pop 
uh, and give really, really keeps us, keeps us interested and in, in thinking about how do we, how do we do that? How do we fuel that and leverage that? But um, it's really just, you have to be a consumer of social content equally as you are strategizing right. it and doing it. Like I, I've, I've not found a really good way to be a strategist without actually being a consumer first. Practitioner of your craft, exactly. Exactly. Um, talk me through Pinterest. I'm assuming that's a huge, <laughs> a huge area for you all to leverage because folks are, I mean, guys too, right? Looking for their suits and stuff like that, but also, mm -hmm. I mean, women specifically looking for everything from flower arrangements to, to cute bar settings to everything. Yes, uh, wedding planning starts on Pinterest. Yeah, it really, it really does. And so, how do we make sure that we're there and that we have a, a point of view, but also we're helping to kind of foster the conversation on that platform? Um, we, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about in, in my teams, um, strategize on what content do we need to provide there. What is our board uh, strategy? Yeah. In that, but I think for for me, because we know inspiration starts there that that's one part of this journey, right? Which is like, there's a lot of ideas, there's a lot of inspiration, but how do you actually move that to action? If you saw that dress that you loved and is the thing, like what's that next step to find yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and so that's that's where we can come in and, and really play a big role is like taking that inspiration and moving it to action. And so really enabling our teams to, to make sure that our content strategy is providing that that service um, as well. But we we do. Pinterest is a big part of our. Well, and I'm sure you all look at social and see what's trending, whether it's like the top 10 this top 10 that and then create your own content that rivals that because, you know, consumers are looking for this specific content and it drives back to your feeds or to read more and, and just let you guys know that you're a, you're an expert in this space or you're a thought leader when people are looking for this information, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We see it all the time in sort of our, our traffic volumes as well, right? The number of pins and saves that we're getting. Yeah, yeah. We, we absolutely do. And we look at it often. What are the things you're looking at uh, in your role in terms of ROI on the digital side? Um, you know, obviously engagements and followers and things are always something people look at, but are there specific metrics that you maybe look at to, de to determine if your content is working well, if you need to adjust strategy, what are some of those numbers that you're constantly asking yeah. for? Yeah, so when I think about um, sort of social from a, let's say, a, a, you know, top of the funnel and upper funnel space, I'm really, you know, valuing and looking at reach, which is yeah. like how how broad, what are, how many, you know, impression reach that we're, we're growing and gathering, right? Is like, what is that view, um, that view rate coming across the, the, all of the content we put in, you know, per platform? And, and, and the, the interesting part of, of social and, and why I love it is, is you can have one platform, I, you know, for example, Instagram, where part of it, you, you know, it's going to be best utilized, reels are going to be best utilized for impression and reach, right? Um, but you know that potentially engagement or traffic can come from stories. Mm -hmm. So really thinking about like, yeah, there's multiple metrics here, depending on the, the unit so in smart. that ecosystem. Um, but it's not going to be like, you can't just think of Instagram as like only for this one metric because it, it's broader than that. It has the opportunity to be more than that. Um, so I try to try to think about the role of social being that it, it's really around how can I expand my reach and my marketing mix through this vehicle? Um, and what features am I going to like, what levers am I pulling to get the best yeah. result? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, the most efficient reach overall. And then for the things that can drive that immediate action in, in traffic, which is easy to measure, um, I, I push, I push into that as when I can. From a marketing standpoint, what do you think is like the, the most undervalued asset? It may be Pinterest. It may be people not looking at their email list um, as, hey, you own this database and you can leverage it a lot better um, than social media. But what's the thing that you think like that just doesn't get enough attention that you definitely lean on for your strategy? Yeah. Well, um, I don't know if it's like doesn't get enough attention because I feel like everyone's talking about video right yeah. now uh, yeah. in every way. But like every, you know, pushing into video for me has been number one. It's, it's a core, if it's a white space, we push into it. If you haven't figured out how to articulate your offering in a video, or you haven't figured out how to um, really kind of, you know, create a, an emotional response from a consumer in a video vehicle, like solve that. Um, because the, the lift that really good video can do is. is yeah. And listen, I mean, Zuckerberg in his last earning call said it best. I think he said TikTok six times in his earning call. So <laughs> Instagram yeah. is becoming TikTok, just so we, we all are clear on that. Here. That's, Here. Instagram Reels is being pushed. They'll never admit that, but they're juicing the hell out of that algorithm, as you and I know very well. Yep. So yeah, video. And, and listen, I've been telling a lot of clients this as well. A lot of uh, friends of mine and, and colleagues is, you know, 
you not you may not be cool enough at the C-suite level. Let's say it's Mountain Dew and there's five 55-year-old white dudes. I get it. You're not going to be able to be the cool people behind the brand on TikTok, but that's where you have to leverage ambassadors, like you said, influencers. Um, can you hire an agency that they can use You know their, their younger talent to be in front of the camera and kind of make sure? Because listen, I mean, I think no matter how much you want to be involved in TikTok, unless you're in it every day, you just can't leverage a platform. Yes. So you have to rely on Gen Z. You have to rely on younger folks that are practitioners on it. If they're not inside your organization, you have to find a way to to get that as a, as a value add too. No, absolutely. I'm, I'm definitely bullish on TikTok. I'm also surprised at it, just that platform, um, the kind of algorithm wars for sure, but yeah. there, there's something about it that I think, you know, the, the content that is working there is, is, you know, educational in a way that I don't think other social platforms ever really got to that really makes me bullish on the future of that platform. Um, in, in unique ways, but yes, if you don't use it and you're not in it, yeah. it's really hard to leverage it. Well, and I think it gets a bad rap. Like it's just a bunch of, you know, teenagers dancing on TikTok. It is that if that's what you like and that's what you watch and that's yeah. what the algorithm will push you. I, I never see any of that. I see, I see top 10 sports list and I see, uh, you know, whatever, how to cook a steak on a grill, whatever those different things that you end up getting served. Yes. Uh, but you know, everybody's for you page is, it's totally, exact, it's totally different, which is a crazy experience, right? Absolutely. I mean, I'm discovering stuff about myself from it. Like <laughs> I, I have a tons of like history information, right? Like there's one, you know, that's being served to me on my for you page is around like, you know, the changing of maps and like the history behind all of this. And I'm like, what? Yeah. I'm interested in this, but like, I guess I am and I'm in it. Yeah. Same thing. I get like bathroom remodels all the time. Like I never once have thought about <laughs> remodeling a bathroom, but apparently I'm watching a lot of this content. So the yes. algorithm is serving me. Yes. I wanted to hit you with some rapid fire questions here towards the end of oh. our uh, chat. So any brands, accounts, or creators that you follow on social that you just enjoy and think are doing a good job? Yes, on social. So, um, okay, I'm going to try my <laughs> try my best to be fast. So one, I love a woman by the name of Lydia Millen, who okay. is a YouTuber out of the UK. She just thrived during COVID, and I'm here for all the joy that she has at home. <laughs> And I also, um, uh, I have to say like Peloton's Cody Rigsby, like sign me up for any class. I, um, I'm obsessed. I love him. And I also love how he can kind of, you know, be an influencer and rep that brand. Um, but I'm, I'm still in it for, for him. So I, I love, <laughs> I love this. It's kind of like Jennifer on your team, like the, the hype man in, in your day that you need <laughs> is yeah. Cody. Um, so any brands that you know you think are doing a good job capitalizing on social trends, and maybe there'd be a campaign you guys thought you did a really good job of capitalizing on a certain trend that was happening that came. I think a lot of you know they call it. Um, you know, brands oftentimes think they have to be a part of every trending meme or any trending keyword, and a lot of times the brands should not be involved in all of that engagement humping, humping as they call it. So. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything that that comes to mind on, on just a, someone that did a good job of capitalizing on that, or if you guys have done that. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I'm not. I'm trying to think of like trends that that you know really spring to mind. Leverage. Um, no, uh, not something super top of mind. But I was just um, kind of reflecting on and speaking of Peloton, which is which is super top of yeah. mind. Of the kind of aviation gin work where they they kind of really took that. That was uh, smart. Official, yeah. um, which was just you know really cool. Like leverage that and and really um, and you know turbo turbo charge some yep. tension there. But um, things like that, uh, I. I like to watch. I like people being really bold and irreverent in some of their work. What type of content is uh, working the best with your audience? Is it more like meme content? Is it educational? Is it the UGC sh resharing your yeah. audience? Like what seems to just be like kind of surprising you? Like, wow, that that's just is the hit that keeps on giving. Yes. So I would say, I mean, ugh, it, it varies by platform in a big way. But I will say that like one thing um, for our audience is, is, and we call this a sort of this fear of messing up, right? Or this mm. fear of, 
um, of doing something wrong is, is definitely a common thread across all of our brands, which is like, how do we help you not do that? Or, or how do we help you, um, figure that out? And how do you like lower your stress? Cause I mean, planning a <laughs> wedding you're just, you know, at an all time high, right? Yeah. But also like, let's like, you know, um, probe at that. Like one of the questions that came up, um, in our community most recently was about, um, what are the kind of worst father daughter dance songs <laughs> that you've heard at a wedding? And we asked that question. We got a whole bunch of, <laughs> of comments. And then it led to us sort of researching why, right? And so that kind of fueled an entire- And you almost yeah. become like that Reddit thread that people can just like dive exactly. into and laugh about. Yeah. Exactly. Oh my God. Or like the craziest things you've seen. I mean, there's 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 a lot there. I love it. I love it. Any book or podcast, newsletter, blog that you consume that helps you be a better marketer? Mm, yes. Um, oh, a better marketer. Well, um, I've recently been into um, the CMO podcast with um, Jim Stengel. Yes. I, 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 you know, that that old saying around like, you know, dress for the, the job you want. I think like listen to the podcast for the job you want, which is like, think big, right? Like what are yeah. those, those kind of CMO and CEO? And I just love hearing how marketers attack um, different and how they think about their business and how do they like really kind of attack um, what is just a massively transforming space. Um, and I, I mean, I love marketing. It's the perfect. Yeah. And that's why like selfishly, I started this podcast because it may just be yeah. one little nugget or one little kernel that like you take from what? this conversation, apply it to your brand. And it's so amazing how you can just, I mean, we're all at the end of the day, we're all trying to market to a consumer and you can learn from any brand across any, any vertical, right? No, absolutely. I love the, the collaboration that it fosters within the marketer yeah. the world yeah. too. What are some tools or resources or apps that you and your team use just to make your life easier? Well, I definitely need some tips here. So I will, <laughs> I will be looking for those. But one, when I first joined The Knot, because I was managing across so many different time zones, mm -hmm. I really used Time Buddy. I don't know if you know the Time Buddy app. Um, it, really, it really helped me make sure that I, I could navigate this virtual world across so many countries. Um, that, was, that came in clutch for sure. I love that. So you're not bugging somebody at three in the morning. Like, it's okay. You can wait till you wake up. You don't have to get back to me right away, especially as VP, right? They get scared. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then um, anybody in your network that you would recommend as a future guest that would provide value to the audience? Uh, anybody come Ooh. to mind on your side? Who? Oh, there's so, <laughs> there's so many. Who would I, uh, who would I suggest? Who do you um, nominate next? Uh, who do I nominate <laughs> next? Actually, one of my favorite um, uh, kind of CMOs that I worked for was Vineet Mara, um, okay. who went um, from Walgreens and is um, and I, I overlapped with him and um, at Ancestry, but now um, is is doing a kind of a food startup in the the Bay Area, um, and he's just a brilliant, a, a good a good person to to chat with and awesome. And then I always like asking this question at the end is like, uh, let's say you're talking in front of a bunch of college students or just, you know, marketers that are younger there in their career. They want to be you at some point, right? They want to be a VP of global consumer marketing. Uh, what are, what's your advice? Like, what, what, what have you learned through your career that you can shed to the, the younger folks? Yes. Um, gosh, one thing that holds true is just being proactive and creative. Um, like you, you don't need to be shy, just be real. And, you know, I had, I was one time on a panel on a virtual panel and um, I got asked a question um, and that, that person decided to then follow that conversation up on LinkedIn. And so we, we had this yeah, kind of conversation yeah. about it and, and there was no kind of shyness of just like, Hey, great chat. Wanted to kind of ask another question. And it led to, you know, me being able to introduce them for a, you know, a partnership they were going to work awesome. on, but just, you know, don't be shy, be real and, and reach out. I find more often than not, people want to, to have, to help whenever they can. And people assume like, oh, she's busy. She would never in a million years get back to my LinkedIn. Like, okay, yeah, exactly. With that mindset, you're right. But no. oftentimes it's not the case. No, people want to, you know, I, I genuinely, people want to help when, when yes. they can. Because they, they, we've all been there one day where somebody helped us yeah. up the ladder, right? So, yeah. well, Kiara, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was so amazing learning about uh, everything that you manage over there. And uh, thank you for dropping that amazing knowledge to our listeners. Yes, anytime. Thank you so much, David. All right. Thanks so much. All right, there she was, Kiara Kimsky, joining us on the program. Uh, as always, I say this about every guest, but I mean, seriously, I always learn so much from my guests, and it is a selfish endeavor. You know, I'm always like picking up some tips and tricks. KG knows too that I'll be on client calls literally days after. Like, did you know the knot actually does some really cool stuff? Um, 
So yeah, so really broke down some major things. I was really curious because before the program, before the research, I didn't really realize like, yeah, you use the not once and you RSVP and then you never use them again or you, you wait to the next wedding. But they've done a really got, good job, KG, I think, of building a community and then making sure they provide value at you at every step of life, it seems like, as you get as you start your family. Absolutely. And I found it super interesting too, their use of influencers and TikTok. Because in my mind, when I think of the not, it's not so in your face of like this product that I'm consuming yes. constantly, but you're actually probably subliminally, at least I am, I think on my for your page, like have all these different wedding trends and it's probably influencers from the not. And I just don't even realize it. I like, I'll admit that I see a lot of baby reveals and it's a lot of guys angry that it's a girl and not a boy. Have you seen, I just get inundated with that content. Like, like guys just don't even no, no shame in their game. They just like will tell you that I'm upset right now. Oh, come on, man! You're having a healthy baby girl. It's all good. So yeah, so much amazing stuff on the on the TikTok stuff. I also loved how she broke down just how she approaches marketing the consumer. Simplify. God, that's such a great piece of advice. And some of this advice is very simplistic, but you forget it as you get into the marketing uh, mindset. But yeah. You, your consumer does not know the brand as well as you know it. And also, you only have a small amount of time, maybe seven seconds. How do you get across your brand, your persona, your core values in a short amount of time? So I love how she broke down some of those uh, you know, those lessons that we all can learn as marketers. All right. Episode 86, KG, thank you uh, for, for stepping out on your first show. We'll uh, hear you on many more. Uh, I'm excited to get going on this new chapter. But this has been yet another edition of the Business Social Podcast. Uh, my name is David Brickley. It's all been powered by STN Digital.